Hello everybody. We are diving right back in, picking up right where the last Astro World episode left off. One of the many questions this investigation sought an answer to. Who was dancing on top of the ambulance cart the most? Who was that prime suspect who spent the most time jumping and dancing on top of that cart, not getting down and potentially getting some sort of criminal negligence related charge against them? They detail in these documents an extensive effort to track down who that was. With social media, they even subpoenaed Facebook. They were trying to attach a name to it, so they got ID info. They cross-verified stuff. They thought then they found their suspect in Danny Vargas. An anonymous tipster also helped lead them to him. The cold case unit of the NYPD even got involved. People really tracked down to verify who this was. They tried to call the phone number associated with his name. It went straight to a busy signal. No other way to get in touch with him was working. Eventually they did and scheduled an interview, which he never showed up for. Interesting but separate note, one of the documents in this trove is a spreadsheet of arrests. A big list of what Officer Rogers compiled of different people who were arrested and the status. This was mostly the fence jumping, trespassing charges, etc. A lot say just dismissed or pending kind of a thing, citation issued, but one row there says currently summons outstanding for a murder charge. Not sure if that's about the ambulance dancing or a separate murder that I didn't know about, but that variable was shocking to see in print. Another question is criminal negligence when it comes to who had power to stop the show and if they did or did not use that power. They really assessed thoroughly what was lacking in this event's EOP, Event Operation Plan, which basically is like a guidebook, a blueprint for a bunch of worst case scenarios like a natural disaster or a bomb threat, what to do to handle a crowd in an emergency. And a crowd crush was not one of the potential issues with guidance included in the EOP. It's hard to say, though, that someone explicitly violated an EOP because they're meant to be kind of just broad guidelines. They're not really meant to be super specific. They're meant to use not much jargon and just be handed to everyone working an event so you don't have to be in the camera work industry or construction industry. It shouldn't matter what you did for the festival. Everyone should be able to easily understand what the EOP lays out. So it is intentionally pretty broad and generalizing. So it's not like if they had followed it to a T, they would have avoided all of this, but it is still notable what was totally missing from that 56-page guide. An EOP is typically drafted by a security team for the event, although sometimes a third party drafts it with security's input. But either way, security is obviously in the loop with it. In this case, the group Unified Command, who have experienced making over 300 EOPs in the past, worked on this as like a third party with security input, presumably. Seth Boardman is confirmed to have cooperated and distributed this EOP, but people are giving different accounts and interviews of how much he was involved in making it and distributing it. It seems like it was not made as a group effort. So maybe different people signed off on it, but not because it was the product of a, an all-hands-on-deck in-person gathering or something. Multiple people, when asked in interviews to review the EOP, seemed shocked that they were in there, like specifically named as having certain titles and authorities they had not been told they had. Some people were listed in there as shunt authorities, an odd word choice to some people. Shunt authority was supposed to mean you're a key decision maker, which confused some people because the EOP also still said who you need to notify in a chain of command before setting something in motion. So don't make a decision unilaterally, even though you were labeled a decision maker. This EOP assigned the power to stop a show to Seth Boardman, plus Emily Okenden and Brent Silberstein. Possibly more, but that's what interviews concluded. Silberstein said to shut down the show, he would have had to go to Festival Safety Management, who would get the chief, as he put it, to make the final call. Others said similar things along the lines of, that's not my prerogative, I would just pass along a message. Which was hard here because people were on different radio channels, mostly without signal access in the first place, etc. Silberstein, in his interview, did stress how much Seth was involved. And it sounds like originally, people were assuming he was the man behind the full EOP. 
It turns out though the investigation found that actually the original EOP drafting was the work of Matt Iyer. There really is no special degree or anything for crowd control knowledge. It's not like you need a specific course or anything. Some states, though, like Florida and Tennessee, do require field security workers to get a special license first. Unified Command does not require this, but they do provide training to new recruits. Some notes from an interview with Matt Iyer. Quote, I asked him if he had any training for his position. He explained that the industry was relatively new, and he had seen it grow and develop over the years. He stated that in the early days when he was getting started, it was all very basic, and since that time it has become more sophisticated. I interpreted his explanation to mean that although he has not received any formal training, he has been in the industry long enough to see it develop to where it is today." The EOP itself has some interesting things in it, like the risk matrix, based on likelihood and the scale of impact and probability, and a crowd crush is listed there as well as civil unrest. It's interesting because it has to be super generalizing about some serious stuff, like it lists major medical incident, low impact, high priority, and minor medical incident, high impact, low priority. The disclaimer in the document says, quote, We have a strict hands-off policy. We do not provide crowd control. We require local staff to assist to handle any necessary physical element of the security process, unquote. A statement on crowd control did say, quote, Travis Scott personnel do not perform crowd control or crowd management. It is expected that local security who have been involved in the planning process will handle all crowd-related aspects and incidents, unquote. So everyone was basically saying local people, the ones who knew the blueprint for this event inside and out, should handle more intervention requiring issues. A civil case had this discovery process, which cited, quote, failing to manage to shape the crowd's expectations was a distal cause. By adding expectations as a causal element, you shift the focus of causality towards the masses, unquote. Expecting the crowd to act a certain way affects their behavior. They also say DIMICE, an acronym for Design, Information, Management, Ingress, Circulation, Egress. There's Ramp as well, Route, Area, Movement, Profile, ways to take different factors into account. The investigative team really did look over a lot of this stuff. Like, they consulted textbooks on crowd control, crowd psychology type stuff, crowd risk assessments, which detail-specific protocol for how to prevent certain moves in the crowd based on the layout. A lot of this goes back to what I said in part one about the map for the structure of the venue, not getting full approval with the narrow walkways and the like. So Danny Vargas, potentially criminally liable for stopping the ambulance from working unimpeded. Boardman, Iyer, Silberstein, etc. They thought maybe negligent for not stopping the show, but there's lots of confusion as to who is supposed to do that, in part due to the weird wording of the EOP. And the lack of knowing who actually finished and signed off on the EOP, because some people didn't even realize their names and titles that the EOP gives them were in there. Then there's questioning Apple and their liability. Apple Music streamed this event and didn't shut it down. There is a difference between stopping the show and stopping the broadcast, so you'd think they would at least just flat out stop the broadcast and have the power to do so. Some might say Apple was just super unprepared for a Travis show because they were hired pretty last minute as a partner for this event. But actually, advertisers do tend to wait until later to join an event because they want to see that it's getting buzz, it's going to be a big deal, it's going to be worth an ad partnership. They want to jump on a project after they feel assured it's going to get people talking and be a meaningful promotional event. So Apple didn't get on until later, but that is standard. However, Brady, an employee from Fuse, said what he usually does is he ends up helping with live stream setup and planning starting 30 to 40 days out. This was less than three weeks. This quote I found particularly interesting. Quote, according to documents produced in the civil litigation, Travis Scott had five stipulations to fulfill in order to receive $4.5 million from Apple per contract. Of those five acts, one was to complete the show. The live stream appears to have been brought on last minute, and detectives believe they were brought in to help alleviate some of the debt the Travis Scott organization had accumulated by building the mountain stage. Unquote. 
Apple's contract raised a red flag for some who said the outside security Seth Boardman brought on was against a contract with Apple. Apple should have hired their own security, so a lack of in-house security could have had an issue with the response. It seems like Apple was brought on so late that they didn't really have time to get their security requests and preferences satisfied. So they hired outside groups, which could have contributed to the response chaos. The investigators also do say they have detected Apple employees as some of those who are nervous about lawsuits and liability. As for Travis Scott himself, his manager David Stromberg has been very defensive, and in an interview with investigators, apparently, quote, he assured us that they were not nervous because they did not do anything wrong and they were anxious to get their musical career back on track, unquote. In December 2021, so just a month later, the investigation was still in its infancy, Travis Scott went on an event hosted by Charlemagne the God for YouTube, interviewed by Charlemagne, which victims called a cruel PR stunt to absolve himself of accountability. At that time, he had 11 pending lawsuits against him, and he'd deny liability in all of them, and went so far as to request all 11 lawsuits be dismissed. He indicated in the interview that this tragedy would be turned into good musical inspiration, that it had helped him build character for putting into songs in the future. The interview was a lot of about him getting stronger from this, and victims' families were not having it. An attorney for over 500 attendees did not want litigation to be drawn out, saying, quote, we need to get to the full unvarnished truth as quickly as possible so healing can begin, unquote but others wanted it to get as thorough as possible, even though that led to delay after delay. A legal rep for another family involved in the lawsuit said, quote, We're taught as kids when you make a mistake, the best thing you can do is admit it and take responsibility. Travis Scott has not done that, made no effort to. In fact, in 50-some-odd minutes, he didn't even say I'm sorry. Every time he tries to shift blame, every time he makes excuses, he just adds to the pain of the families that have lost loved ones, unquote. An attorney repping the families of two best friends who died at the festival said, quote, Pre-packaged public relations stunt. The families are smart and they saw it for what it was. In his interview, Travis Scott talked about his fans being his family and that he's right there with their families now. The families needed him to be there during the show when Travis Scott could have and should have saved the lives of their children. The only time Travis Scott will be with them is in court, unquote. One more quote from a victim's attorney. He called this interview, quote, an hour-long exercise in classic gaslighting. Gaslighting is a form of manipulation seen in abusive relationships where it's an attempt to manipulate the facts so that the victims begin to question their own experiences of reality. That's his brand. That's what he does. For him to act surprised that people got hurt and even killed at his show is perplexing. It won't work on a Harris County jury who hears all the facts, because the fact is Travis Scott has an abusive relationship with his fans, and he's used that to build his fame and fortune, risking people's lives and their livelihood, unquote. There are lots of interesting, damning in hindsight text exchanges from some key players. Reese Wheeler texted, Shauna Borman, I would pull the plug, but that's just me. I know they'll try to fight through it, but I would want it on the record that I didn't advise this to continue. Someone's going to end up dead. This could get worse quickly. Panic in people's eyes. But when asked why he didn't actually continue to press for the show to stop after repeated attempts, it sounds like he strongly had the attitude of, that wasn't my place. In an interview, Reese said, quote, There's a fine line between professionalism and recklessness, and at that point he felt like he did all that he could do to get the message across while still maintaining that professionalism within his scope of duties. Had it been him in the decision-making position, he would have had the worry in the back of his mind that if he acted too quickly or prematurely, he could get blacklisted by the industry, unquote. Apparently, Reese's lawyer told him that HPD, the Houston Police Department, are who had the purview to stop the show. Reese pointed them to his communication with Emily Okenden and the notes about the investigation as it pertains to trying to interview her are really interesting. These are all direct quotes from investigators' notes. November 17th, I reached out to Emily. I was contacted by attorney Will Moy. I spoke to Mr. Moy. He discussed Emily is available, wants to cooperate, but he does not know her exact location. He said he has to get caught up to speed on the case and would be in touch. 
I reached out January 2022 after not hearing from him or Emily. He notes he tried to get in touch again in March 2022. A week or two later, another attorney said she's still waiting on client's permission to send the questionnaire. They also want a grand jury subpoena extension and then said nine days later, quote, we are not accepting service for Emily. We will reach out to Emily about her willingness to participate, unquote. In June again, they reached out, still no response. October 2022, asked attorney for a status update. After not receiving a response, I asked again on November 10th, 2022. In two instances, we have heard more of Emily. We heard about her in the meeting with Shauna and Seth. Andrew and Sydney mentioned that Emily told Shauna to shut down the show after seeing people receiving CPR. And Emily was brought up in the Reese Wheeler interview, where he stated he used the Cytops radio, asking if they could see what he was seeing. He stated Emily responded with, yes, honey, which he took as condescending. That was brought up multiple times in interviews, that apparently saying, do you see the chaos out here, was responded to by Emily in a condescending as they took it manner. Like, yeah, honey, I got this, I'm aware. There's Soria, who gave testimony about working for Paradox. She said she was warned by Paradox not to speak to the media. Lyons and Simmons, a law firm, indicated that they had, quote, evidence that may contain people knowing things were going to go wrong before the concert. They mentioned these conversations were among stakeholders, unquote. The detectives tried to interview Carol Have, and apparently she's been busy with personal matters. Trey Hicks, they wanted to involve. His legal team said they wanted to know if he was a target in the investigation. Brad Wavra was apparently hard to reach as well, and his attorneys wanted to know if he was a target before proceeding. Shauna Boardman had to provide a bunch of context to quotes that these texts out of context look bad. Like after Rolling Loud, she said, you're just doing your job, unlike the rest of them. She said she just meant that as a way to compliment Seth, saying he was working a step above the rest. Seth texts her, quote, there is talk of police canceling this, unquote. She said, quote, they need to, this is not okay, unquote. So that reiterates the assumption by some people that actually police were the ones that were supposed to shut it down. There was one text from Silberstein, this, quote, bed was self-made, unquote. Like, you made your bed lie in it, which looks really bad out of context, and they didn't get more info. Shauna said, quote, Brent had a tendency to vent his frustrations, up to including copying and pasting the same text message and sending them to other people. She did not know what he meant, unquote, meaning that she didn't know what he meant. He probably was copying and texting the bed was self-made comment to multiple people at the same time, which doesn't help how it looks. Other texts that look not great is one where Seth says before the show, quote, our only saving grace at this point is the stage not meeting code, unquote. And Emily texts back, praying hand emoji. Like, let's hope the show is just called off because this is unsafe, this isn't gonna work. That's what it looks like. But then apparently she clarified she didn't mean that as praying hands emoji, but high five emoji, like we did a great job setting this up, making it work despite issues with the setup, clashing heads with Travis's team. There are so many other texts that get to the same premise of, hey, we should be worried about this. Let's hope everything goes well, fingers crossed. Here are some key passages. Quote, our focus narrowed on conversations between Brad, Brent, Emily, Seth, Shauna. It appears our focus has turned towards a possible negligence case. This is because there are messages with some of these five stating how the festival gets shut down or the stage is not approved. There are messages wanting to quit or dealing with the cast of the festival. Of the stakeholders, Brent remains, Brent Silberstein, the only one to cooperate fully by providing multiple complete statements. Seth has provided a limited amount and Shauna has provided a statement through her lawyers. Emily has yet to cooperate. Unquote. So Silberstein sounds the most forthcoming out of those people. It sounds like Seth, after initial cooperation, got a bit scared and, quote, we did not hear from Seth again. He did not respond to phone calls. We later heard that Seth told T. Harden, the Live Nation attorneys, told him not to speak with police because we wanted to charge him. Live Nation attorneys would later tell us Seth Boardman had gotten his own personal counsel. His attorneys requested immunity be provided to Seth. We told them that it might be premature. We determined we would not be able to proceed at this time for the investigation as we wanted a thorough investigation by interviewing Seth and his attorneys. 
They did then plan an interview that got delayed. They cited a medical issue. They then cited an issue with the possible immunity deal in exchange for cooperation. When charging someone, you have these meetings about discovery. So in one of those kind of meetings, they were talking about Boardman culpability. And the presentation basically given back at them, the defense went like this, quote, They advocated Shauna innocence and their concerns that a grand jury will or can indict via direction from the district attorney cited Texas case statutes pertaining to negligent homicide and how their clients did not fall within the realm of said statute. I asked a few questions as to why this information was not presented to us earlier. We were told because they only answered the questions specific to what was asked, because they did not know what would be relevant. The meeting ended rather abruptly and unexpectedly. They brought material to perhaps give us, but it is unclear if that was their intent. I have not heard from the attorneys for follow-up with the questions we requested to be answered, unquote. The problem with when you don't defend yourself, they hear the other people's sides of the story and you don't get your say. So they'll go off of the other's word. And one word they went off of instead of Seth and Shauna was an employee who recalled them working together on an event twice as big, just the following week in Florida after Astroworld. And said they didn't seem nervous at all given what had happened a week prior. Quote, we asked if Seth or Shauna ever expressed any guilt or a desire that they had done something differently. He stated that they did not, and he believed that they did the best that they could with the resources they were given, unquote. Quote, on July 28th, 2022, I spoke with these attorneys. I told them based on the current information we have, Shauna could be a target. I read the text messages. They stated they were aware of the text messages, have not spoken to Shauna in detail, stated Shauna was dealing with a firearm incident at the festival. He believes she could be in the mindset that things were getting taken care of at the front gate because the location Reese Wheeler was describing was not the location where the deaths occurred. The location Mr. Wheeler was describing had HPD personnel, medical personnel, and security. I told the attorneys that I understand this may all be true. I told them that we do not know Shauna's statement, however, and the information in the EOP provided by Seth stated she is the security director and outlined her responsibilities. I told them without her statement, we do not know what action she took, if any, when receiving the text message. I told them the investigation is still civil in nature, but we have to investigate all possible criminal elements, and that I wish to provide the most thorough investigation possible. The attorneys told me that they understood and would reach out to Shauna to provide insight. Unquote. The interview notes, August 2022, when they got some responses finally. Upon receiving the message from Reese, Shauna went straight to the right side of the stage. This is not where the deaths occurred. Shauna walked up and down the barricade, did not see anyone unconscious, was made aware of a person unconscious at the other stage. Shauna realized Reese was wrong in his assessment. Shauna went to the area to make sure it was populated with the correct staff. She saw paramedics, police, security, and no unconscious people. Shauna did not see any panic and saw a strong police presence. She said police were taking pictures of the show with their phones, which reflected the matter is not extremely dangerous or a sense of emergency. Boardman's attorneys continued by saying Shauna received a text from someone at the K-9 unit who had found serious weapons and the manager over there needed help on how to handle this issue. She texted in barricade zero reception. The attorneys mentioned the EOP, people that can shut down the show, are within the barricade. She finds Seth to tell him of the person down. We asked if Shauna shared any of this information about the text from Reese. She did not. She remained within the barricades throughout the entire concert. The attorney shared their opinion in saying to report the text information to the police would be redundant, as they were already in the area. They added Reese was inexperienced with crowds and did not utilize his radio to share the emergency if he truly believed there was one. Boardman's attorneys reference page 9 of the EOP, where it states communication should be conducted on the radio. They stated Matt Iyer was to facilitate communication from the command post to other personnel. They added Reese has not done a lot of shows. They added the radios are there to be utilized for an emergency, and text messages should not be an expected way to communicate, unquote. One attorney also pointed a finger not just at Reese, but Unified Command for pointing cameras at Kylie Jenner before the show started, rather than looking into the crowd and seeing a fuss. Quote, Lori stated, this shows further that nothing is wrong in the area. I saw this as a defense statement for Shauna. 
Lori stated Shauna has a ground perspective and everyone on the ground cannot see the issues going on because of the ground level. The tragedy would have been worse without Seth and Shauna. There were stakeholder meetings. Brent Silberstein headed and guided the meetings. The stadiums invite the stakeholders. Medical emergencies are not foreseeable. Alex Pollock says it's ridiculous that a crowd crush could have occurred. People are being pricked for the fentanyl, unquote. That's them paraphrasing, listing the excuses given by the lawyers. Some emails that were provided as part of an investigation into possible foresight. These are direct quotes again from emails. They will need a much larger medical tent. They might be crazy trying to put lights on top of subs for this show. There's potentially going to be a death. And then these texts. 7.03 a.m. These barriers are nuts. Matt said they used the same ones at Lala and the crowds took them down there. Looks like we are in Alcatraz. 2.10 a.m. Worried about how to turn over this video. Told Seth to consult Live Nation attorneys. 9.10 a.m. The next day. Guys, also, please remember, absolutely no social media posts on anything concerning this, please. 9.24 a.m. Besides no social media, please no talking slash gossiping about what you saw to others outside of our company, and especially not on site. It's a delicate and sensitive situation for the show. You don't know who's around overhearing things. 3.45 p.m. We got a CYA on our chain of custody. Okay, I think that CYA like cover your ASS, but that's just what I interpret that abbreviation being. It could be jargon. 7.04 p.m. Latest word from Live Nation attorney is that we are to continue recording overnight, even though we still only have power to a handful of sites, but the main stage is still active. The site is locked down due to several different litigations. We are going to proceed with Matt, then have another meeting with the lawyers. I need you guys to think about how we are going to move forward on this. One law firm argued in an interesting way regarding Silberstein, as well as Sasha from Scoremore. I, I don't know what context to add here. This is what it says. Quote, Silberstein, Sasha, and the CEO of Live Nation changed the layout of the Travis Scott concert or allowed it to be changed a week prior. This caused the funnel from stage two to stage one. Also, the concert timer was approved, but that was argued by Brent Silberstein not to be a good idea. Also, Brent is in hiding in Austin, Texas, unquote. Very strange. The report, though, also does make sure to note not just what made them suspicious or concerned about lack of cooperation, but what made them encouraged and they appreciated the fully cooperative parties, including Joe Bailey of Unified Command. This security team lawyer was cited as, quote, very cooperative and communicative, has facilitated interviews, questionnaires, and documents, unquote. Now, I'm telling you what the investigation says about cooperation and to what degrees people were pushing back. Not to specifically say, hmm, this person is suspicious. I'm not telling you to come for anybody. This is what it says. And I do also want you to keep in mind that it's not just potential guilt that could make someone not cooperate. There are a million other reasons. True, genuine fear of being prosecuted and feeling like you did the best you could in a panic-inducing situation. Fear of being blacklisted, having this bad mark on your permanent record in your career field. Fearing reputational harm for anyone in your social circles who, through the law or the media, finds out you were working this tragedy. And of course, just dealing with and coping with trauma and not wanting to relive that night to investigators in an interview, which is cited several times in the documents that an attorney said, our client is shaken, our client cannot participate, wants to help, but simply mentally cannot right now. The FBI was kind of involved in this case, but it was mostly focused on Texas. The FBI involvement was more about just helping facilitate tech know-how, how to operate certain, access certain software, camera footage, etc. So they shared resources and were open if their help was needed, but the case they were forming was about a more local focus. They summarize all of it in a one-year-later look at the investigation as it unfolded. Quote, first priority was to locate and identify victims. Fentanyl lead was followed through and unproven. Autopsies were conducted and results concluded. Multiple interviews from all different entities. Scope was to find out who knew what and when. Vision of case changed daily and still does to this day. Is this criminal, civil, both? Track down the ambulance lead. Still have not spoken with Emily or Shauna. We have not had a thorough interview with Seth. We also received the text messages from Reese to Shauna that opened a new scope of this investigation. 
and we became invested in learning everything about the main festival command post. Our investigation has constantly changed as we slowly found new information. That has added to the time and is ultimately why the case has not been wrapped up. There are documents indicating people slash entities knew there would be issues before the concert. We are also digging further into the command post and setting up more interviews. The investigation continues to grow, unquote. There were other investigations too, so this is a criminal case that has been closed, but civil lawsuits can still continue. There have been settlements reached though. The Department of Public Safety at first considered pursuing their own charges. Attorney Noah Wexler told investigators he was considering taking on two possible miscarriage cases as criminal for having induced the miscarriage. They ultimately compiled all other findings and their big argument into an enormous presentation for the defense attorney to review, which she did with her staff May 3rd, 2022. She told them to keep going. Like, yeah, keep going. We can have this before a grand jury. Then they wrote this one year later follow-up at the end of 2022 and said their focus basically kept shifting, but was now focused on these texts and the main command post and who there knew what. The grand jury did get the case, but they declined to continue pursuing criminal charges. The ultimate summary of the investigation, then I'll give my ultimate summary, which is quite different. Quote, all deaths and injuries sustained could have been prevented. It is a tragedy for lack of better terms. There were a number of issues that arose, and it is possible that those issues compiled together is what led to the final result. Though the conclusions we have drawn may appear to bring about negative feelings towards the entities involved, many of the events that took place are industry standard. This determination is based on the information within the investigation we currently have. Patrons overran secured areas, which subsequently caused a delay in event staff's response and event staff removing other patrons out of dangerous, overcrowded sections to safety. No monitoring of crowd compaction. Communication equipment did not facilitate clear communication for medical security and production. Security guards were not adequately trained to work in a festival capacity. Confusions and delays in communication of 911 calls. Event staff failed to check patron credentials. EOP did not clearly indicate communications between entities and direction for show stoppage. A possible lack of carnival rides and game usage during Travis's show, alcohol sales shut down, increased the show viewing due to patrons not waiting in line, unquote. So all this led to the crowd compacting in that one area and not being handled properly. By the way, I do just want to flag, sorry, I've called EOP event operations plan. It's also emergency operations plan, just to be clear. Since this event, there have been a few changes, apparently. Apparently now, even since the Vegas shooting, there have been EOPs that focus more on what to do in more scenarios at shows, how to keep the crowd safe. Reese specifically in his interview said, now he requests more show pauses to assess. That's the case. Unfortunately, there's no clear, nice, easy, clear, distinct answer to point to saying this caused it, we'll make sure it never happens again. It was so many factors, it's just inevitably an unsatisfying conclusion or lack thereof. That is the case, but now my personal opinion, I have a couple of big thoughts that sum it up. One is, I'm glad this investigation took the turns that it did, because I think it flagged a really important overlooked aspect of live events, period, not just this one, which is that people need to stop being so freaking devoted to chain of command and protocol. People just need to, I guess, feel less constrained in an emergency to break that chain, to just say, they need help, I'm going to go help. I'm not going to be a bystander. Obviously, that could compromise your own safety. That could maybe you worry you'll just be a nuisance in the way of people who know how to help. But I do feel like people should take more into consideration exceptions to the norm being I'm not going to do anything beyond my very specific outline purview. 
I also think it brought up some important points on accident about the importance of not just brushing off what young people do. These victims were so young. The oldest was 27. I mean, this crowd was so young. And throughout the show, they were trying to get help for each other and help each other and couldn't. And I mean, parts of the report have details like they went to the show after school and stuff that make it feel like, oh my gosh, it really brings home how young they were. And they were not taken seriously. So I think the investigation accidentally brought up a bigger issue of belittling young people or calling them just overt liars. The self-fulfilling prophecy of saying they're just hooligans who are gonna jump fences and cause chaos all day. When they say, hey, there's a real issue here, ignore them, they're bluffing. That costs lives. It could have. Many interviewees use wording like anarchy, attitude, these kids, hooligans, knuckleheads, things like these just annoying kids get off my camera equipment, stop crying wolf, that kind of attitude. And I do think that affected the response. So I wonder how much the response would have changed and just been more compassionate and urgent if there wasn't some sort of implicit ageism in a way. It's very generalizing to assume if a person's being just a young dumb kid who jumped a fence, they're also going to be just a young dumb kid who is invincible and is lying if they're trying to get your attention for a serious issue. Like kids can be goofy and stupid and be people worthy of more believability, more respect, more they deserve to be taken seriously. Of course, they have some moments I don't approve of, but come on, I just feel like the youth variable here is really important and important for the artist. Which brings me to my third point. I do think Travis has some culpability. I'm not going to pretend I know what it's like on stage to perform and know how far into the crowd you can see, how well you can really hear in a talkback mic. I don't know how much I can believe how much you really saw or heard. To me, from fan-taken footage, it looks like he sees into the crowd what's happening and keeps going. But I have no idea if he really did see that or he just generally looked in certain directions that made it look bad for him. So I don't know what he heard. That being said, regardless of what he knew in the moment, he really should have been more aware that he had fomented an intense response before. At this event, throughout it, he's saying things like, make the ground shake, no bystanders, everyone rage tonight. If I were an artist and someone freaking fell off a balcony, I would stop saying stuff like that. I would say this got too real too far. I took it too far. I'm sorry, we can still have fun, but in a safer way. At the very least, I would do that for the sake of not having legal repercussions down the line. If you want to take morals out of it, it's good for your rep too to knock it off a bit. So in general, using gate crash video footage to promote Astroworld, then they crash gates and people get injured. You can't be surprised then that more incidents follow. You encourage the sense of devil may care. I also just can't wrap my head around being okay with writing lyrics about mosh pits and stuff and people raging, releasing those songs with those lyrics after the balcony incident. I just can't even imagine doing that. So all that overall made me very just disappointed. Because it is possible. Everyone's listening to the artist, literally. Like, if he had said, hey, calm down, they would have. I do think so. But that's not what he wanted. I hope that also this investigation made more people realize that artists don't know their own safety protocols. They trust other people will take care of that stuff for them. So I think it actually might be helpful if more celebrities were in on these meetings about security and stuff. Because, I mean, Travis was saying he wanted certain layout designs for this event and was told no. And he was probably like, why not? Having no idea actually certain things are not formatted that way for security's sake, for safety's sake. It's not just about a creative vision. There are reasons why no one has tried what you're suggesting. So it might actually be helpful if artists actually knew it's not so simple and really had to learn what safety factors have to be taken into account with the ideas they pitch other people to take care of. A sense of accountability I would love more artists to have. Now lately there have been reports of all these fans forgetting how to treat artists right and throwing stuff on stage. That's ridiculous. Stop it. What are you doing? That's a separate conversation. I do think no artists deserve something thrown at them. But artists do have a sense of responsibility for some of the things their crowds do. They prompt a response. When they don't, it's the fans' fault. When they do though, when they say, please rage, and fans rage, that is on you. 
I am not surprised, though, that the grand jury did not pursue the case because it really is such a complex picture and it's impossible to fully verify and prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Travis knew people were dying and kept going. There's just no way to prove he truly didn't hear or see the chaos. I can see why the grand jury thought we really can't prove this beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, the standard of having to prove something in a civil case is much lower, much easier to prove. You just have to prove it was more likely than not to have been the case. So they can probably prove it was 51% likely he would have incited something. It's harder to prove the criminal case requirement of like 95 plus percent positive something happened. I do want to end, though, with one final observation that's a glimmer of hope in all this, which is that I was touched by reading this whole report. It broke me a bit. But part I'm grateful to have taken in are the reports of young people at the show helping each other, like trying to make paths for people to carry people out, trying to help people get lifted over the barrier, giving people CPR or flagging medics, climbing up camera equipment if that's what it took to get people to take them seriously and help. The efforts people went in the crowd to help each other to handle the situation, chanting stop the show, calling it an emergency more than anyone else. They really stepped up and took the role of adults in the situation in a lot of ways. My glimmer of hope at the end of all this is to think about those people and the human impulse to help. The ways we help often don't work out because in the moment there's panic and mixed signals, but that innate human desire to do something to help. A lot of people have that innate feeling. Not a feeling of, I don't care if you get hurt, I don't care if there are consequences, but a sense of selflessness and a desire to just help people out. That's what concerts should be about. Concert crowds are meant to be excited in a different way. (laughs) Excited to treat each other fairly and just have a good time and help give each other a lasting special memory. It's a community. Fandom is a community. And the death toll may have been even way higher if those young people in the crowd hadn't really stepped up and kept the pressure on to stop this thing. Those are all my thoughts about this tragedy, and I hope more can be learned from it about events going forward. Thank you all for tuning in today. I'll talk to you all again about a very different topic very soon. Bye, everybody.